So we've got a theory of space and time, Einstein's theory of general relativity. And the idea here is that matter controls the metric, which tells you how far apart any two little elements close together in space actually are. And the metric might not be the normal one, the Pythagoras' one, but can actually be curved, be rather strange, and this causes things to move in funny sorts of ways. But what's this got to do with cosmology? Well, I think we're pretty lucky because, you know, there's almost an infinite number of ways one could twist and turn space. But the universe conveniently appears to be pretty much the same everywhere. That is, that every part of the universe seems like every other part of the universe, and there is no preferred direction. And that turns out to give us a lot of leverage on what the metric can or cannot be. And this is something that Alexander Friedman went through and figured out. But let's first think about how things work in spherical coordinates, which is not something people normally work in. Okay, so we've talked about the metric before um, telling you if you've got two objects with the position x, y, and z, then how far apart they are. We've also talked about cylindrical polar coordinates, which is where you measure um, how far out something is around and height. But there's a third sort of coordinates, and it turns out this third sort of coordinates are the ones we actually need to understand the real metric of our own universe, and these are called spherical polar coordinates. They're also the coordinates used to measure positions on the sky, latitude and um, right ascension declination, and indeed on Earth, uh, latitude and longitude are spherical polar coordinates. So what we've got is we measure angle down from some pole, which is theta, we measure distance out, and we measure angle around the equator, which is phi in this case. Yep. And so I think it's pretty obvious if we want to go from distance, so ds, remember, is just how far you're going to travel mm -hmm. uh, between point A and point B. And our point A's are going to have coordinates r, theta, and uh, phi. And if we want to just move out in radius by a little bit of r, well, that directly translates to s. Yeah. So if you just move in r, ds is just going to be dr. Yeah. Makes sense. That's easy. Now, if you're going to change an angle down from the pole, this would be a bit like latitude on the Earth or yep. declination in the sky, then if you move a given angle, the actual distance corresponding to that is going to be bigger the further out you are. If you're very close, and I move a small angle, it doesn't go very far, whereas if I move a, a very long lever arm, the end moves much further. And this is just the small angle approximation we've talked about many times in these courses so far, which is just that the distance is just r times the change in angle theta. Yep. So your s, the amount that you move, is that radius times the angle in radians. And since we are definitely in the small angle approximation, d theta, so it's as small as you can get, uh, it should all work. Yep. Then we get to the slightly more complicated one, which is in the phi direction. And so this is like going in a circle around the Earth up, not at the equator, but up at some latitude. So let's say doing circumnavigating the Earth at 45 degrees south, for example. Yes, and what you can see is that if you're at the equator, um, sine theta is just 1. So around the equator, it's just angle times radius, just yep. like you've had for theta. But as you get closer and closer to the poles, um, it takes less distance to circumnavigate the world at plus 89 degrees than it does at the equator. And that's factored in by the sine squared theta over here. In fact, at the, if you're actually at the north or south pole, you can circumnavigate the entire world without moving at all because theta is zero or 180 degrees, um, sine of that is zero, and so there's no distance moved. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense because if you look, this is essentially going to be the radius of the circle you're doing here is r sine theta is its size. And so uh, that d phi is, is just, you know, made smaller essentially by that, that factor out in front. Yep, so you've got the three components of motion, outwards in r, uh, downwards in theta, and round in phi. And so you just, using Pythagoras, square them all, add them together, and that gives you how far you've moved. Voila. Voila. So, that is the common sense metric the, for a flat universe. But uh, the Robertson-Walker metric, which is the one that we get in the case of our own universe, if we assume it's the same everywhere, the so-called isotropy, is a bit different. Not very yeah. different, but just different enough to be painful, I guess. So, ds, once again, just the same. So, there's a dr squared, r squared, d theta squared, so the sine squared, d phi. It's all the same, except for... Yes, and that. Hmm. 
And it turns out that if the universe is isotropic, that everything is the same everywhere, um, this is the only possible metric. Yep. Which is a really strong constraint. We know the universe isn't uniform on small scales, so maybe the metric is different on small scales like the Earth going around the sun, but on really big scales, it has to be something like this. And we've got these two funny terms. So what's this doing? It's multiplying the whole thing, A of t. This means it's a function of time. It doesn't depend on distance or angle or anything like that. It only depends on time. And what's that going to do? Well, let's think. So imagine that is getting bigger over time. So if A is increasing over time, then that's a multiplicati multiplicative factor in front of all of the rest of the metric, which means that the metric is going to get bigger and bigger. It's like magnifying like magnifying the universe. Yeah, so any two objects have, say, a particular coordinate, a particular r, theta, and phi, then without doing anything or going anywhere, they'll get further apart. Oh. So that sounds just like what we need to make the universe We're, expand. Yeah, okay, so that's good. So that's, that's if at is getting bigger. at yeah. could, of course, be getting smaller or mm. doing anything, really. We're going to have to come back to exactly how yeah. at behaves. All right, and so then we have this other bit, which is this dr squared over 1 minus kr squared. So... That is a funny term, so let's think how that might work. Yeah, I mean, this, this worries me right away because it seems to suggest that maybe pi could be different. Because mm. think of what pi is. You've got a circle, and you've got a circumference, and you divide it by the diameter, and you get pi. What we're seeing here is, for a given value of a and t, if you move in angle, theta or phi, the distance is exactly what you expect. Nothing's changed. But if you move in radius outwards, it could be either more or less than what we normally think, mm. depending whether k is positive or negative. Like if k is positive, that's going to be 1 minus something. So it's going to be divided by something small, so it'll actually make it bigger. So if you had a circle, the circumference is going to be the same, but the radius is going to be bigger, or maybe smaller if k is a different value. I mean, that sounds a bit weird. It does sound a bit weird, but, hmm... I wonder if there is some analogy to what we see here on Earth. Well, let me try and work out exactly what the uh, pi actually would be as we change k. Okay, let's do that. 